El niño cubano está condenado a poder sufrir y, a, y hasta morir porque un gobierno no quiere que nosotros adquiramos los medios suficientes para esos niños. The blockade has affected me in my economic and my social development. El objetivo fundamental era quitar una fuente de ingreso al país. They deserve more than this. They deserve an end to the blockade. They deserve to live a life in dignity. It's not true when they say that their policies is to help the Cuban people. They've been torturing our population, both Trump and Biden as well. In January 2022, Activists organized a charter plane to Cuba full of powdered milk to alleviate shortages caused by the U.S. blockade. The milk was to be dispersed to pediatric hospitals in Havana. They deserve more than this. They deserve an end to the blockade. They deserve an end to all the sanctions that have been put in place by the Trump administration and been kept by the Biden administration. They deserve to live a life in dignity. Breakthrough News tagged along to investigate how the blockade is impacting the Cuban people. After almost a year in the White House, President Biden didn't fulfill his electoral promise of lifting the sanctions that imposed Trump. We want that President Biden lift these sanctions right away. He promised that he will do that. Havana is a relatively normal city albeit a much safer one than most other equivalents in Latin America, and without the staggering inequality. People were super friendly and willing to talk politics. And their primary concern wasn't government mismanagement or evil communist dictatorship. It was the shortages caused by the U.S. blockade. The blockade has affected me in, the eco in my economic and my social development, in the style of life that we should like to have in our country, according to our conditions, according to our own possibilities. The revolution of 1959, led by Fidel Castro, transformed Cuba from a playground for Western exploitation, colonialism, and rampant inequality to a people-centered government that ended Jim Crow-style segregation and provided free healthcare and education and housing access for all. The blockade tries to stifle these programs by creating shortages and causing inflation. It stipulates, for example, that any product that's sold to Cuba can't have more than 10% of U.S. materials in it, and any ship that docks in Cuba can't dock on U.S. shores for six months, even if it was carrying humanitarian goods. Every year, the U.N. General Assembly holds a vote about the blockade, and every year, every country votes to end it, except for the U.S. and Israel. Despite these measures being unilaterally imposed by the U.S., corporations around the world comply to avoid heavy financial consequences. The truth is that U.S. Uh, behave as a predator. From Cuba, they've taken away every year five thousand million dollars from our economic revenues. This is terrible for any country. Five billion. Exactly. Five billion. Five yeah. billion dollars. dollars. That, that if the embargo didn't exist, we will have that income to buy medicines, to build uh, infrastructure. They are being so mean to Cuba because they also want to force the Cuban failure. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they say, uh, Cuba is blaming the embargo for every failure that they have, but they are their own problem. They say, hey, let's do it differently. If the embargo is our excuse, why won't you remove it? Cuba had learned to survive under the blockade, even thriving in certain industries. For instance, Cuba has a state-of-the-art biotechnology sector that developed five COVID vaccines. Its most effective, Abdullah and Soberana, have efficacy rates over 90% and are easy to store, making them ideal for developing countries that lack the capacity to produce or refrigerate at the cold temperatures required by Moderna and Pfizer. But the U.S. blockade is a major obstacle to mass production. First, to buy um, equipment, advanced technology equipment, 
uh, is forbidden for Cuba. We cannot buy. And today, the equipment is so complicated that you need a maintenance from the specialist from the factory, and you can not have that available at this time. So are there people who may have died that didn't have to die because of a delay in producing the vaccine more quickly as a result of the blockade? Well, of course, if we have all this available, we could be more, more faster, quicker than we were. While vaccine hesitancy has hampered U.S. vaccination efforts, Cuba managed to vaccinate 90% of its population without a mandate because of widespread trust in the medical system. But under Trump, the blockade got much more intense. He imposed 243 new sanctions that attacked Cuba's main sources of income, tourism, remittances, and the medical brigades. Trump even added Cuba to the state sponsor of terrorism list. Despite campaigning on reversing these destructive policies, Biden has done the opposite, adding even more sanctions. We are, there will be more unless there's some drastic change in Cuba, which I don't anticipate. Even the New York Times has characterized Biden's policy as a harder line than Donald Trump. And it's a torture in a country because if you go after the fuel of a country, you are going after what we Cuban women use to prepare food for our children. We are going to the electricity that we use in, 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 in incubators, in hospital. You are going to the population. So it's not true when they say that they care about human rights in Cuba. It's not true when they say that their policies is to help the Cuban people. They've been torturing our, our population, both Trump and Biden as well. The new restrictions, combined with the economic devastation from the pandemic, which brought Cuba's tourism industry to a standstill, caused Cuba's economy to shrink by 11% in 2020. While no one is starving thanks to ration cards dispersed by the government, people spend hours waiting in line for basic items. And that's precisely the point. A U.S. State Department memo from April 1960 makes clear that the goal of the blockade is to weaken the economic life of Cuba and decrease monetary and real wages to bring about hunger, desperation, and overthrow of government. That's why U.S. officials got so excited on July 11, 2021, when a few thousand Cubans protested deteriorating living conditions. The U.S. and its media stenographers immediately exploited the protests, lying about their scale and exaggerating the Cuban police response while pretending there was no U.S. involvement. Meanwhile, Cuban voices like Disamis Arcia of the independent digital media outlet Latiza were totally absent from mainstream coverage of July 11th. Fue una situación crítica en la que se encontró el país por una acumulación de problemas, por una acumulación de errores, por una acumulación de dificultades para resolver problemas sobre todo a sectores de la población que han tenido históricamente menos capacidades o menos facilidades para resolver sus problemas o sus necesidades. Pero sobre esa situación, que fue una situación complicada, se montó una operación de subversión. Y se montó siguiendo en muchos de los pasos que siguieron los manuales de lo que normalmente se puede identificar como operaciones de golpe blando. Sí. While many Cubans recognize the U.S. role in creating discontent, they also understand that people were expressing real frustrations. One of the most devastating shortages in Cuba has been around medicine. This is a pharmacy in Havana. The pharmacists tell us that before Trump's new sanctions, they were able to get 100% of the medications they needed. But since those sanctions went into effect, they can only get about 27%. So they have severe medicine shortages. I spoke to actual doctors around Havana who can tell you why there are shortages and how they impact the medical system that they serve in. Todo el mundo que vive en Cuba, las personas también que han visitado nuestro país, saben que tenemos limitantes, no podemos decir lo contrario. El bloqueo nos ha limitado mayormente eh, la parte de, de recursos eh, materiales. Debido al bloqueo que existe, hubo que adquirir medicamentos a través de terceros países, como China, Venezuela, muchos países de aquí de, del área, que nos aportaron, nos ayudaron mucho y nos donaron todo material de cura, material de jeringuilla, además la preparación y la inteligencia de los cubanos, que fuimos capaces hasta de hacer equipos de oxígeno, porque no, no lo podíamos adquirir de otra forma en el mercado mundial por el bloqueo. Even with help from allied countries, the medicine gaps are hard to fill. You can find that in very specific medicine, 
antibiotics on other medicine, for example, that are needed for a specific patients, and you cannot buy. You cannot buy, and the people die, even children, because they are produced only in the United States, and the United States don't issue license for us to buy those, uh, those medicines. Despite the blockade, Cuba continues to offer free universal health care, with more doctors per capita than anywhere else in the world, and social indicators that are on par with the developed world. But this isn't without its challenges. I spoke with Aleda Guevara, the daughter of Che Guevara. For example, in my case, I'm a medical. I know of medications that are in the world. Desgraciadamente, of the 10 medications new that are today in the world, eight belong to patents of the United States of North America. Por ley del bloqueo, nosotros no podemos adquirir esos medicamentos. Entonces, nuestros niños pueden tener patologías graves con los cuales podíamos resolverlas con esos medicamentos, pero no los podemos adquirir por el bloqueo. Es decir, el niño cubano está condenado a poder sufrir y, a, y hasta morir porque un gobierno no quiere que nosotros adquiramos los medios suficientes para esos niños. The U.S. has also attacked Cuba's medical internationalism. Cuba has sent over 450,000 Cuban doctors to 164 countries in the last six decades to provide health care in underserved areas. Sometimes the Cuban government receives payment for these services from countries that can afford it. U.S. officials have accused the Cuban government of human trafficking doctors and even suggested they might be spies. Cuba wasn't sending doctors and officials to Bolivia to help the Bolivian people but rather to prop up a pro-Cuba regime headed by Evo Morales, who sought to, to maintain his grip on power. Bolivia now joins Brazil and Ecuador in recognizing the Cuban threat to freedom. Bravo, Bolivia. Once the pandemic began and those doctors were desperately needed, countries like Brazil were begging them to come back. But the U.S. kept attacking the doctors. Facilitating a program that subjected more than 10,000 Cuban medical professionals to force labor conditions in Brazil. Dr. Juan Jesus Luis Aleman is deputy director of the Moncada Clinic in Havana and a member of the Henry Reeve Brigade, a special medical mission that the Cuban government dispatches to provide medical care free of charge in disaster zones. In the first place, how do you pay for a person who will risk his life to save the other? There is no way to pay for it, do you understand? No hay como pagarlo ni hay como ni obligarte a hacer eso. Eso es difícil. Esto es voluntario. Inclusive para uno es hasta un honor poder servir a los demás. Ya es parte de la filosofía interna de uno. A pesar de que parezca que todos somos homogéneos, tenemos opiniones muy diversas dentro del grupo de la brigada. Somos la antítesis de, la, de, de ser espía. Ahí nadie espía a nadie porque no hay nada que espiar. Hay que trabajar y mucho. Regularmente no hay tiempo para espiar. What do you think? From your own perspective, is the purpose of the U.S. attacking the medical brigades and pressuring countries like Bolivia and Brazil to expel the Cuban doctors? Eh, claro, que el, el objetivo fundamental es, es quitar una fuente de, de, de recursos al país. La gente sí no va a contratos de, de salud, no, no tiene contratos de cooperación. Pero las brigadas permanentes sí, como Bolivia como Brasil, tenía un contrato que, que el país obtenía dinero por, aquel, por eso. Casi todos estaban patrocinados por la Organización Panamericana de la Salud, eran contratos bien elaborados, ¿no? Y eh, el objetivo fundamental era quitarle una fuente de ingresos al país. This kind of disinformation remains a problem in Cuba, like anywhere else. And the U.S. spends millions on anti-Cuba propaganda, mostly based out of Miami, that blames the state for all of Cuba's problems and accuses the government of using the blockade as an excuse. U.S. Congress passed every year 20 million to meddling in Cuba, legally. We are not going to talk what the CIA spent. We are not going to talk about other agencies spent it. We are not going to talk about what they grant to others in order to hide the source of the money. But the openly meddling operation these ideas dominate U.S.-based social media platforms, which promote anti-government accounts and outlets, while at times blocking those that are pro-government. This presents a huge challenge for the revolution, as many young people, like in the rest of the world, get their news from the internet. Uh, from where do you get your news? On Google, 
eh, Facebook cuando estoy revisando normal me salen algunas noticias y eso. Eh, computer, eh, internet. Bueno, por todo. internet. If you get your news from mainstream media outlets or Joe Biden, you might think Cubans have no internet. We're increasing direct support for the Cuban people by pursuing every option available to provide internet access, help the Cuban bypass the Cuban people bypass the censorship that's being mandatorily imposed. But when I was in Cuba, not only was there internet, it was actually the US doing the blocking. The blockade leaves no part of society untouched. The Cuban Revolution ended institutionalized segregation and gave opportunities to Cuba's black population. But the blockade undermines some of that progress. Pedro de la Hoz is head of the Aponte Commission, a special governmental body launched 12 years ago to address racism in the country. Que al afectar toda la vida del cubano y al afectar la economía cubana fundamentalmente, ha retrasado los programas que en el caso del racismo permiten eliminar las condiciones de vulnerabilidad de los sectores más desfavorecidos de la sociedad como los negros y los mestizos. Uno de los problemas que tienen los, las familias negras en Cuba era el problema de vivienda, de hábitat, de dónde vivir. Cuba no ha podido construir todas las viviendas que quisiera, es decir, una vivienda digna para todos los cubanos por graves limitaciones económicas que tiene que ver con el bloqueo estadounidense. If the blockade is doing all this damage, why does the mainstream media work so hard to hide it? Maybe it has more to do with preventing a socialist alternative to capitalism from succeeding in the Western Hemisphere. If it wasn't because we are a socialist country, Cuba could not survive. As it's very difficult to think that any country subjugated under a system of, of coercive unilateral measure, the way that they've been punishing Cuba, that we survived that, but we did. This is a country of almost 12 million women and men and children and elderly population that are fighting for, uh, to protect our achievement. So socialism saved Cuba. No people have endured such a total siege for so many decades as have the Cubans. Americans are born and die and take it for granted that their country can punish an entire people. Cubans are born and die living in the context of this struggle with an American boot on their neck. For the world, the international community, the UN, it just seems to be the natural order of things. Because it's been going on for so long, it's not shocking, but it should be. No lo aceptamos. Por eso es que, por todos los medios, intentamos romper ese bloqueo. Hoy la solidaridad en el mundo rompe ese bloqueo.